Washington Mullets. At forward number 43, 6'11 from Iona, Jeff Rulin. At center number 44, 6'10 from Hampton Institute, Rick Mahorn. Hey, it's Adam here. The audio is delivered here in podcast form, but you can watch our conversations online. Full episodes will live on the Beef Brothers channel. Yes, that's right. Rick and Jeff are on YouTube. Relevant links are in the show notes of your listening app and also appear beneath the video. A quick warning that occasional language during this series is not safe for young ears. Now, let's meet M-E-A-T, the Beef Brothers. Welcome to episode two of Beef Brothers. This video will be on YouTube and in podcast format on your listening app of choice. Let's say good day to the iconic duo of 1989 NBA champion and 18-year veteran Rick Mahorn and 1982 all-rookie first-teamer and two-time NBA All-Star Jeff Ruland. How are we this evening, gentlemen? Good day, mate. I'm real good. Good day. Good day. Good day. Good day to you, to you both. Our episodes begin with a discussion of today's NBA. We'll cover some of the latest news and hear Rick's and Jeff's opinions, and then we'll turn back the clock as I ask them about their lives in basketball. Today, I hope to ask about the recent passing, the great Paul Silas, on a more lighter note about the iconic Beef Brothers photo shoot, and finish with some listener-submitted questions and comments, which will be fun too. As we record this, it's the evening of December the 12th in the US, and we've got seven games on the NBA schedule today. Whilst we try and aim to release an episode every two weeks during the season, it's not sometimes possible. So since we last spoke, lots of things have happened. That's par for the course in today's NBA. Yesterday, Rick, you were courtside in Detroit as the Lakers visited the Pistons and held on to win in the final moments there, courtesy of a Austin Reeves three-pointer. Uh, Detroit were down by double digits early in the second half before they fought their way back into the game. Boyan Bogdanovich had an awesome game for Detroit, the third highest scoring game of his career, a 38-point effort. The Lakers, though, improved to 11-15. and 15. Your Pistons dropped to 7-22. and 22. All that said, from your vantage point, where are these teams at at the moment, and what did you make of that matchup yesterday? Hey, listen, stop telling me what my record is. It's kind of hard to get a 7-22, and 22, 24, whatever it is. But, you know, it was a great game. The Pistons are very young right now. Bogdanovich had a great game, especially in that third period where he was getting the ball. Both of our teams dealing with injuries. But when you look at the Lakers, they still have two two of the top Hall of Famers in this league that's playing till this day. Anthony Davis is special and LeBron James is special. They carried the team, I think they scored 69 of their 120 something points. But what impressed me about the Lakers is that they, everybody hung them up for dead. Now that they're playing better basketball, Anthony Davis is doing his thing slowly as it keeps going. And LeBron is always going to be LeBron. It's, it's great that you can see them up close and personal. But I'm really impressed with the Pistons because you could have just laid down and, and, and just gave up the game, but they, they fought back a couple of errors. And that comes with being youthful. Guys with not that much experience in the game. We had uh, Duran, who was a rookie, 19 years old, getting 14 rebounds. Those things that you can build on. And as the, the Pistons continue to play together, get some continuity, get some, you know, comfortableness in themselves and, and make sure that they come out there prepared, knowing that they have to start the game off well because the Lakers got us first and foremost in that first first four minutes were down 18 to five and you go like dang not again but they fought back yeah it's tough to come back from that sort of deficit early on but they did really well to get back into it and it was only a two-point game in the closing 20 seconds so jeff you're on the way home at the moment driving did you catch the game yesterday that rick called i caught a little of it i had a couple questions for horn number one was what did you think about the lebron 45 year old and then is Cunningham out for the year? Well, don't know about Cunningham. It's supposed to be a day-to-day kind of process. And they don't inform media like myself, even though I'm one of the former players. That part, nobody says anything. He's just sitting on the bench. But also, 45-year-old LeBron, let me just tell you something. If he wants to play till he's 45, it just doesn't look like father time caught up with him. He's getting a lot of these little injuries where you go, Wow. Thought he was indestructible. 
But Father Time catches up with you. So one year that he was out and he was hurt for half of the year, that probably says, hey, slow it down a little bit because he did take a game off here and there when, in today's NBA. And I'm not mad at him. He's going to break Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's record. And if he goes even to 45, if he wants to play with his son, then so be it, man. I, if, if I could do it, I'd do the same damn thing. I always say, play as long as you can and then play one more year. <laughs> and then play another year. You're damn right. If they'd have kept calling me, I'd have got 20 in. If I would have had a decent leg, I would have tried to play 15 more. But here's the thing, Adam. Let me tell you this. I learned from the great Caldwell Jones. And may he rest in peace. And we've lost a lot of our soldiers, the guys that played the game of basketball. Most recent, we'll talk about Paul Silas. But what Caldwell Jones told me, when the phone is still ringing, take that job. Where else are you going to get a job that's paying you multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions now, to say, hey, you want to be here? In my standpoint, it's what I can send the nurturement teaching how these young men are coming in earlier and earlier, give them back. Yeah, and how to be professionals in this game. And that's how to be a pros. And that's the key to me when you find a lot of the teams that do have the elder statesmen. It's a great thing to have because, hey, now you got a father 24 hours a day. Well, Horn, that's a great point, but it's also you can have some older veterans. Like when I was the last year I coached with the Sixers, Willie Green is doing a great job. Willie was like the last year or two, and he learned a lot at Golden State. I won't get into the other crap, but yeah, they're so valuable, older guys. But you get you get the wrong older guy. You're right, Jeff. You find some that are there just for being selfish reasons. But then there's yep. also unselfish reasons where the guys like Wes Unsell taught me and Spencer Haywood taught us as well. But then you'll find some that just say, I got a job. I don't care what y'all do. I'm getting paid for what I do. And then I'm going all about my business. I like those insights. Thank you both for sharing. And yeah, both of you acted, I guess, in that particular role of being mentors for the younger people. Rick, probably when you headed back to Detroit for your last couple of seasons, and then even briefly in Philadelphia, and also Jeff, I guess, in the 1990s there when you were with the Sixers as well, and, in, and briefly in Detroit, there would have been guys that you would have been looking out for, I, I assume that were young and just up and comers in the league. Definitely as we got older, I think when we were, when we were in our early 20s, I think Rick and I would just well, try to keep the rookies in a lot. We met in World University game, but the first time we put on practice jerseys, I knew he had my back for life and I had his back. We get those rookies, man. They get them big heads Whoa. sometimes. Got to keep them in line, man. He got one common goal. Say like some names when you talk about Oh, when you beat the Iron Days ass and you threaten Jeff Malone. Jeff and Malone, ass, and oh my uh, gosh. It was all done with love. Uh, no, right yeah. over cut. A lot of the guys you intertwine with as professionals, and that goes on in life too, Adam. You know that people you can work with, people that you know will be part of your friendship for life. That is so key. Like Jeff said, we bonded that we knew what we each other was doing on the court. That is something very special. And a lot of people don't understand that when you build a friendship, even when at a championship, I don't talk to everybody from that championship team, but I talked to a few that were very inspiring in my life and they still will be inspiring in my life. I look forward to elaborating more on that as the episodes continue on. But yeah, thanks guys for both sharing your your views there. And, and hello to Darren Day and um, Jeff Malone, if they happen to be listening to this after the event. Hot, hot, toddy. Don't worry, we'll talk about that later. Okay, I'll look forward to it. This one is probably more for you, Jeff. Yesterday, the Pelicans and the Suns just completed a home-and-home home series, and the game at New Orleans ended in so-called controversy when uh, Zion Williamson threw down that hammer dunk in the closing seconds, breaking the supposed do-not-score in the final seconds of a game which you're leading, that so-called rule. Yesterday, the Pelicans then went to Phoenix and beat them in overtime. They played a home home in New Orleans. They didn't go to Phoenix. Oh, it was home and home. 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 Sorry, I didn't even realize that. I saw there was... Yeah, we, we've had a couple of those this year. It's been interesting with the NBA, and it kind of helps out travel as well, because now you just know that you stay in there for a couple of days. We played uh, the Atlanta Hawks twice at home, and then we went on the road and played the Milwaukee Bucks twice at home. 
it's similar to what the playoffs are about, where you play two at home and then you play two at the next, and then you go it's one, like a college one, one. weekend. Let's travel. I'm well for that. Yeah, I didn't actually realize I did that. I saw the highlights of the first game where it all went down with the fracas after the buzzer, and I read the review and recap of the game yesterday. Okay, thinking. so because we played New Orleans the game before they played the Suns, and let me just say this to you: it rules. You comment on Zion Williams is special, and when I tell you, it's like how can somebody that's that big stop on a dime and spin to the basket? And you can't block a shot because his body is so wide. Then you see some uh, Tony Craig or whatever his name was, Craig for Phoenix Suns, try to take a charge against Zion Williams. <laughs> Are you fucking crazy? Your life is on the line with this huge young man coming at foot. Man, I love Jeff and I are some big dudes, but let me tell you something. If somebody coming in like a bowling ball, I'm getting the fuck out of the way. I'm telling you that right now. Let me ask you, what do you think of this analogy? I, I told Adam earlier that I thought Zion was a younger version, a young Charles Barkley, but better look. Well, you know what? It probably is. You look at the way he walks. I always look at people's gait when they walk. Yep. He walks on his toes to the side. Yep. And it's like, it's real quick. Barkley was more of a long, long gated runner. And you go, okay, Charles is going at full speed, but he didn't have as much control as his Zion. I'm telling you, man, I, I swear. I was like, did he just stop on a dime? I'll tell you what, though, man. I, I saw a couple of games of Charles the first two years. That mother, he was dunking everything off a rebound. My God, how he could jump back in then those days, man. Let me just say, that's when he had the pizza. And he was just jumping, you 320 pounds, and you uh, were running and jumping. Oh, man. Remember that time we played in that All-Star game, and he ran in that halftime and went right underneath the, they had the keg out for after the game. He went in there and drank underneath the keg for about three minutes. This was fun. Back to the Pelicans and the Sun. And when he did that, the 360 slammer, my rule is if as long as time on the clock, you might as well finish the game. But then again, someone came with this rule, oh, just dribble it out. No, nah, that's on you if that's your pre your preference. Sometimes you get caught up in the moment. Look, the Pelicans haven't been anywhere that that playing game helped them out last year to come this year. And they still are not at full strength. They still have an all-star in Brandon Ingram that's not playing. But the fact of the matter, they're in first place in the Western Conference, which is one of the gauntlet ones with, like, Damn. Damn. They just beat him twice. Did you like his statement either after the game or the next day where he said he, he apologized his mom didn't raise him that way? I thought he acquitted himself terrifically. It really was well, well said. And you know what? My whole thing is just like you said, man. Like, like they were mad about Goldberg laying in it at the end. Rudy, big Rudy. They were pressing. So my whole thing is get mad before you go out and get your ass. In fact, that's what I'm saying. If you don't want nobody to do something on you, Adam, I'll tell you right now, you could have fouled him. Mm -hmm. Why don't you run down there and follow him and say, we don't play that? That's just you who you are. But there's so many friends in this game, and it's a buddy-buddy system. I don't know. If I'm playing against Jeff, Jeff and I will play against each other. For 48 minutes, we weren't friends. Mm -hmm. Nope. After the whistle blew, after everything was all said and done, let's go get something to eat. Let's chill out. Remember, Jeff, when I played against Tim McCormick and we went to Bridget Foy's in Philadelphia, after the game, and Tim McCormick walked in. Tim, Tim McCormick ain't know how to take it. And Jeff was like, hey, I said, what's up, man? He's thinking I want to fight. Oh, okay. <laughs> From what happened on the court. Yeah, but uh, I've always left things on the court. But if, if I let my wife tell it, uh, I don't like Carl Malone, and I probably don't. I treat him with respect. Tell you right now, man, I was a guy that I respected, but I didn't have a, lot, a whole lot of friends on other teams. We didn't roll that way back in the day. <laughs> nope, you don't have friends. Like Jeff said, we were friends since the World Games. We really butted up, and it was like, yeah, okay. Even when we played on different teams, even been practice, our practices were fierce. And then it was like, let's go get some lunch, man. We Let's go, man. Forget that. We we hit each other yeah. with and start laughing because it's like, 
Is that all you got? <laughs> Bring some more. There was a guy that wrote about that once he came to practice and he was amazed that uh, we were hitting each other and laughing at her. Uh, ooh, that lovely boy. But you got me one time with that little, that little raggedy, little short arm elbow. I feel, still feel that shit. Do you remember yeah, when you went to Sixers and I had retired and I came over to practice one time? I was assistant at the Sixers and we were down in Philly before the season. And you came over, you know, we used to like hit each other with the shoulders. You hit me. I went to practice. Yeah. Talking, I'm like, Fred, I got to go to the doctor, man. I'm like, it's fuck. <laughs> I went to my shoulder. <laughs> I can't make practice, Fred. I'm going to see Dr. Jack. I, should, I need a shot. <laughs> that was my good shoulder, man. That was my good shoulder. I had to get a surgery after that. I don't know. That's supposed to be your friend. You got to tell me we're doing something because we, we ain't hit like, like two rhinos going at it in the middle, but. It's so much fun. Adam, if you go on hoop pipes and you put in the old articles, put in rule number one, and there's one on there, the roughest guys in a day, or what it tells about the guy came to practice and he left just shaking his head. He's either those are two crazy dudes or two macho dudes. (laughs) We had a ball, man. What did you make briefly of all the the so-called hype after the game, just following that Zion dunk compared to what happened in the 80s, guys? Yeah, the, the thing you're talking about with that little skirmish after, it wasn't nothing going to happen. Nothing was going to happen. Fighting days are over. When we got in fights back in the day, they used to find you $1,000. The last fight that I saw, when the Lakers played here last year, Isaiah Stewart, and I swear to you, that was that's one one young man. He, he lost it, and you don't want to get him started. So last night, it was kind of like he was checking LeBron, and you're waiting to see if anything going to happen. And the fact of the matter, you know, I saw a couple of little hits here, a little extra little hits, but you know what? The referees let the guys play through these contacts. And and I thought it was pretty much a well refed game. Too bad we didn't get the win, but it's like, man, they didn't show any favoritism to either team. And then you think that the Pelicans and the Phoenix Suns are going to get it in. They played in overtime yesterday. Let me just say this to you. That was a good game. You figure you get you get the best of both worlds where you're thinking something's going to pop off, and it didn't. Well, thank God it didn't because it's one of them TV games that you go, oh, hell no, not today. Mm. Big French kid. Have you seen him play at all? What is it? W- Wanda Yama? Wimben Yama. I call him, yeah, Wanda well, Yama. Yeah. I'm looking at him. What do they call him on the games now? You make a player? That That is one that's... A unicorn? He's past the unicorn. A unicorn? No, they already get it. My man is four inches taller than Rudy Gobert. He's four inches taller than that dude, and he's still growing. And the thing is, who's going to get him? That's the way you worry about who's going to pick him up. Pistons get him. Hopefully the Pistons get him. But that's another story to be talked about because a lot of times you look at it and you get that first pick, you got to take him. You're not saying that the, the draft lottery's fixed, are you? Not saying that the draft lottery is fixed. I, I was trying to cause some trouble there. Sorry. That's what I meant. Exactly what I meant. The Pat Ewan will flip coin. Nobody saw the coin being flipped. That's what I'm saying. That's another thing to discuss. But as this league starts to take off and get into like the beginning, now all of a sudden football is kind of dwindling down. And let me tell you something. That FIBA World Cup, that is some exciting shit. That's all I would say. I used to go to the games when I was in Spain with Football Club Barcelona. 100,000 people. They had a waiting list of 200,000. They had a moat around it. They used to rip the benches out of the concrete. They were drinking shots of cognac. The referees would go down this secret passageway. That shit was crazy. They ain't doing that shit over there. No, what is it? Guitar. They have to get the (laughs) (laughs) guitar. Good point. Yeah, good point. Breeze, when I played in Italy, we used to have the games on Sunday, and you hear all that noise, and I'm going like, good Lord, in the Barcelona, man, it was 7 million people. The whole town would, the whole town just shut down. That's how it is. And the party would start. Let's go back to basketball. How about Joel and B last night? Joel and B got 50. He was kicking ass and taking names. He had a one-legged guy in an ass-kicking contest. Listen, listen, he played against the Charlotte Hornets. Are you kidding me? Who was guarding him? That shirt came down and guarded the motherfucker. 
We could go out there and guard them if they got uh, Plumlee and uh, B.J. Washington. Uh, good point. It's a different era, but when you and I played, there was only 23 teams. Now there's 32, so. True. Hey, listen, Adam, a high school kid wouldn't come out. I think we talked about this on the first episode. All the high school kids came out when the merger. No, not even the merger. ABA was still there. Mm-hmm. Moses Malone, yeah, Bill, Willoughby. Bill Willoughby, and Daryl Dawkins. Didn't happen very often for sure back in those days, and they uh, had to really prove themselves. Well, it's 30 teams, Jeffrey. You're mad. You're thinking football? You're thinking football? I thought there was 32. I got to stop thinking about expansion. Got something you can expand. <laughs> Adam, we got to get back on track. <laughs> Deary, Ray. This looks good now. <laughs> I hear you, baby. I went to the gym today. I have got it going on. Look like you ain't stayed in long enough, <laughs> but go ahead, Adam. Yeah, fuck you. Don't hate on the way, man. Up until today, as we record this, we've got Luka Doncic, who's leading the league at almost 33 points per game. He's already had six triple-doubles on the season, but Dallas so-so in the standings. They're not dominating, but they're thereabouts. Anthony Davis, as Rick mentioned, has been on a tear recently, and uh, he's leading the league in rebounding at almost 12 and a half per game. And we've got Tyrese Halliburton of uh, Indiana, who's leading in the assist category at almost 11 assists per game. The season's about 30% complete thereabouts. What teams or players should we really keep an eye on as this season progresses, guys? From the beginning, I was taken by the way Utah was playing. And I like the Pelicans. I like the Grizzlies. Obviously, the Celtics are playing lights out. It's just such a long season. I don't know. I really hope that they're not peaking too long, and I was totally wrong about Sacramento, but I thought they were going to have trouble integrating Sabonis. She's so unselfish, but they've figured it out, and they're, they're getting more involved, and they're pretty good. Well, see, here's my thought. When I look at all 30 teams in the league, there's a lot of parity. Any given day or any given night, a team can get hot. Like last night, you had the Houston Rockets defeating the Milwaukee Bucks, and you go like, did Giannis play? You go like, did Chris Middleton play? Chris Middleton, I think, got hurt. Yeah, and then you also got the Drew Holiday play. Then you go, okay, even when they didn't have Chris Middleton, who who didn't play? That's the thing that you look at. And then you go, did we expect Indiana to be in a part of winning games? Did we think Utah, like Jeff said, that Utah was a team going, okay, well, are they into this transition of being integrated with a new coach and a whole new philosophy? Then you go to Sacramento, but then you look around. Once you got the best record in the league, did you expect New Orleans? I already expected um, Minnesota, but one one team that this is, is disappointing me is the Dallas Mavericks. And I, I look at them, if they were supposed to be this team that you say, well, this window of opportunity, the only got is Luka. Luke has the ball in his hands 70% of the time. So much. So much. 70% of the time. And don't get me wrong. He's a hell of a player, but you he's need to great have player, people man. around him. Too much. Yeah, he's not going to wear his ass out, man. He's going to be an old 28-year-old dude, man. And Well, he already an old, young dude right now. Yeah, no question. No way. He's a hell of a player. They got to figure that out. And so when I look at it, Adam and Jeff, it's, it's all the parody, man. One team can get hot, but some teams are being consistent. You look at the Golden State Warriors, only won two games on the road. They won 11 games and lose two games at home. You don't know what's going to happen. That's the beauty of the NBA sometimes, isn't it? The surprises. It's such a long year, man. It's such a long year. It's even longer when you play 41 minutes a fucking night. And that's what Luke is doing. I think he's leading the league in minutes played. And you go like, you're going to wear him out. But then that's when you see somebody six. And then you go... And people spend their hard earned money if it's a road game and he's sitting and it's like, I can't, I'm a little bit. Go to a fan. game to watch somebody and they they don't even play. It's hard to swallow. I look at the league now. It's all, it's all individualized. Look at the uniforms. Adam, I know why you were mixed up with the Pelicans and, and the Phoenix Suns because they changed uniforms. Are you thinking that who's playing home and who's playing away? Exactly right. That's what tricked me because I only saw some brief highlights of that. And then the, the Pistons had on different uniforms again, like the lighter. St. Cecilia jersey. That's it. That's it. So that did throw me. You know what it is, y'all? It's, it's called merch. 
let's have like six jerseys so somebody could buy six different jerseys. I thought about different jersey for every home game. Shit. They got to pay them salary somehow. No question. So what's the difference between when me played to now in terms of your players are an investment that you want to keep. So you sit them out, you rest them. When we played, they knew if we were hurt that we would play. They wouldn't stop us from going out there with one leg. But here's the thing. I'm torn about them not playing every game, but in the same instance, hey, I was out of the league at 28 because I played, I played hurt. So we all did that because the game has changed so much right now that we used to fly commercial. Now it's charters, which I'm like, I ain't mad at them, but it's like you, you get food. The nutrition is different. It's an investment for each team. It's an investment. Each player is an investment. And I'm not mad at it. It's like, okay, I can't go hot and cold. You get disappointed. We're throwbacks, Rules. We get disappointed. But oh, no, know. I'm happy for all these guys. I'm sure when the next TV comes, we're going to have a guy making $100 million. God bless you. I wish I was born at a different time. Hell yeah. What was Ronaldo, the soccer player that got offered 275 Yeah. Man, I'd be like, okay, well, you want me to play on one leg? I'm good. Yeah, that's <laughs> generational money, man. I know you took a lot of care of a lot of your family. I took care of my family, but now it's generational money, man. And I ain't mad at them. Get all of it. Get it all. Get it all. Come on, baby. Get it all. Even the college kids with these. They get you near know, The owners are making money, and then, then their franchises are going through the roof. I saw today that it was a $3 billion bid on the Suns. I, I really think it's going to go to four or five. Yeah. Hey, why not? But do you don't make money as a governor of a team. You don't make money till you sell a team. As we record this, guys, just yesterday, a three-time NBA champion and a two-time All-Star, Paul Silas, sadly passed away, age 79. His final season as a player was in 1980. It was just a year before your rookie season, Rick, and two years before you started playing in the NBA, Jeff. After retiring as a player, just for some context here for our listener, Silas was head coach of the San Diego Clippers for three seasons, and then he was an assistant with the Nets, the Knicks, the Suns, and Hornets before he took over as the head coach in Charlotte in 1999. Four times he took the Hornets to the postseason. He also coached rookie LeBron James in Cleveland, and his final stint as a coach was two years with the Bobcats in the early 2010s before they reverted back to being named the Hornets. So all that said, what influence has Paul had on on your lives respectively? You want to take it first, Paul? Yeah, I got it. For me, I was fortunate to be coached by Paul Silas. Got to know him as a, not only as a coach, assistant coach with me in the Nets, but also seeing him on the Knicks bench and Every time I would see him, he would say, boy, I'd have had to lay some wood on you. I said, you know what, Paul? You can still lay wood on me. I'm going to get you. He was a little light in the cake. He was a guy that always, when he was the assistant coach with us, spoke his mind, told us what we needed to do as a big man. And I'll tell you one funny incident that happened. We were all practicing with the Nets, and we are at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And Paul was throwing the ball to the big man. What's his name? Dwayne Shinsons wasn't ready. May he rest in peace. Maybe he'll get a piece of Paul while he's up there. But here's Dwayne Shinsons in his head with the ball. I could see it in Paul's face. It was like, oh, my gosh, what did I just do? Knowing that Shinsons was one of them dudes that would go take a tennis racket and beat somebody up. Man, it was funny. But that dude had a bad haircut. Sorry. You had the mohawk, too. Oh, Lord, there you go. I wish you could show some baby pictures of you, mullet. Oh, you're killing me. He was a guy that, as a player, always had much respect as far as him going out on the court and performing. Basically, we're throwbacks of what he was, and that's how the NBA was at that time. And then as a coach, he was fiery. As a head coach, he was fiery, but he was still a very passionate and loving guy, so... I'm going to miss him. I was trying to call him for the last last couple of months, but he never picked up his phone or whatever. So had to know something was wrong, similar to what Bob Lanier, when I kept calling him for about a year. And when you don't hear from him, you go, I'm like, man, I just want to say hi and I love you. I didn't know Mr. Silas, but I got to tell you that I grew up watching him and Dave Collins. I got my jump book from Dave, and I consider myself a really good offensive rebounder. I got a lot of that from watching him. From watching him, man. Learned a lot of little stuff, little nuances. 
Yeah, he was a great competitor, man. Well, I wish I would have been able to play for him. Yeah. Yeah, very well respected. And obviously lots of thoughts and uh, comments coming in from all the NBA fraternity, past players and present. So it's a sad loss for the NBA yet again. On a much brighter note, though, Rick and Jeff, I just wanted to quickly ask you about that iconic photo shoot of the Beef Brothers. There's at least two iconic photos that come to mind. You're wearing your early 1980s bullets warm-up pants, but then they've got you in like these white coats, and it looks like you're in a cool room surrounded by copious amounts of beef. What are your memories of that photo shoot, how it all went down on the day, and, and even to this day, it's a lasting image that sticks with everybody? It was a meat locker, number one. I don't remember whether that was in D.C. or Baltimore, Horn. Do you? It was in D.C. When it was in D.C., I was like, can we take some of this meat home? I was like, hell with all this shit. I, after we take this shoot, can I get that half a cow that's like right next to me? Adam, Rick has the real photos. He's got the photos that weren't published of me and him with knives. <laughs> with knives in our teeth and all kinds of different shots. Oh, my gosh. Hey, look, I got to get a couple copies of those. Oh, please share those, Rick. Adam, we got some. No, I can't listen. No, those. Well, I got a picture of me, Jeff, Don Collins, and who was it, Frank? Carlos? Carlos, Terry. The one where we all together, we're in the playoffs. They were all dressed up as ladies except me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it is the funniest picture Ever. Yeah, I'll send it to you, Adam. I thought I might have sent that. I have not seen that one. Jeff looked like us. I got the one in the Big John Stud picture. Big, big John, John Stud, the wrestler. Too big. That's awesome. He looks like a small forward compared to me and Rick. We should have beat him up. He thinking he was all that tough. We could have done some wrestling, though. That would have been a great tag team. Should have did that after, like Goldberg, like Goldberg did after Goldberg, football. Goldberg, we would have whipped Goldberg. the shit out of Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Damn right. No, no, I wanted a piece of Andre the Giant. Andre? Oh, no, no, man. Straight to Andre. I knew someone that ate with that dude, man. He would walk in a restaurant. He'd get one of everything on the menu. <laughs> Let me just say this to you. I was in the airport in Detroit with Moya, my daughter, my oldest daughter, and we were in there, and he walked by, and he shook my hand. I thought my whole forearm and hand was engulfed. I was like, I ain't messing with that big man. Oh, hell, he was in there and he was drinking. Corn, they said he used to drink like 10 cases of beer, a couple cases of wine every night. Mm. Mm. There's a fantastic documentary about Andre. I think it was put out by Bill Simmons as The Ringer. Yeah, The Ringer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, terrific documentary about Andre. It's so fascinating. What a, what a character he was. I got to watch that few quick um, listener questions or comments just to wrap things up. These are come from the Beef Brothers YouTube channel. So we need a lot more of these. I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. We need a lot more. Of no, that's okay. More subscriptions and more questions. Shoot. Now, this one's from Tommy D on the Beef Brothers YouTube channel. He says, love you guys. Thanks for the great early 80s bullets fun. Rick, you picked three sixes out of a game that I attended at the Cap Center. He thinks it's Mo Cheeks, Clint Richardson, and he says Lionel Hollins, maybe. Sounds like you rang some bells that day. What happened, Rick? No, no. Oh, was it? No, it wasn't Lionel Hollins. It was Mo Cheeks, Richardson. It wasn't Clint. Because Clint, Clint, no, Clint was dodging me. I got Andrew Tony. I, oh, okay. The Boston Strangler. Andrew Tony. That was my Christmas list, Mo Cheeks. And, but I told you the one when we were in Philly, I came out of the game and sat down and the rebound went up. I caught Lionel Hollins and three of his teeth in my hand. <laughs> yeah, and he told me every time I talk to him, he tells me, thank you, because he's got a whole new full set. <laughs> <laughs> he owes that to you, Rick, does he? Yeah, he owes that to me. I told him, I, I take Venmo, I take Cash App. <laughs> I, take I caught three of those on the bench. Adam, I told him, you know your little ass don't supposed to be in this paint. Don't come in here again. They should have been mad at Moses for not calling out the street. <laughs> Bless Moses' soul, but I miss that guy too, man. George S., also via the Beef Brothers YouTube channel. Yeah, George is on there. I, I interact with him. He's got some real shitty questions, so I hope he's coming back with some good ones. <laughs> this is like a combination of two. All right, good. George is moving up in my book then. He says, if you could foul a player really hard and get away with it, who would you pick from your playing days? Lambert would get it for me. Lambert would get it for me, even when I played with him. 
Go, I may just go to his house and hit his ass right now. <laughs> oh, hit him once for me, too. I'll get him twice for you, Rules. But, you know, <laughs> I have less than bad. Rules, you, when I paired up with people, it was it was fierce competitors. I can tell you that much. That's fantastic. And just one last one. Now, this is from Keith B, also via the YouTube channel. It says, great to see you guys. I saw my first Bullets game in 1964. Miss those days. Any comments on Minute? And just ahead of Minute talk, I'll quickly advise that there's an excellent extended conversation, which I'll put on the Beef Brothers channel that features Jeff and Minute during the 1986 season. But gentlemen, what are your thoughts? That's the uh, video, Rick, with the uh, lady calling in and asking Manute, how long is his spear? Oh, man. <laughs> or when Manute will walk out the shower and says, Udw, Udw, Udikwata, Udikwata. <laughs> My man loved Heine Benz. Remember when we used to back in the day in Indianapolis, we took, I took him into the Red Garden, the girls wouldn't let him leave. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait a minute. How they about they put chairs and things up against the door to keep him in? <laughs> hey, listen, it was funny when I picked y'all up after the game when y'all came up here. And we were going over to Canada, and Manu couldn't fit in my truck. He was in the back of my Bronco. He was in the back of it, and we had to let him in and out the Remember back. Remember he had his Bronco, and they took the front seat out? He used to sit in the back. He took the front seat out. Yeah. And drive it. <laughs> <laughs> so when we were going to Canada, we needed to have our ID. And, and Manu, Manu didn't have his ID. Manu just showed his American Express. And we go <laughs> get <laughs> Manu, I used to hang with him and I loved him because no one would bother me. They would go up to him and if he was in a shit mood, he would just pretend he couldn't speak English and he would just sign an X on the autograph. Oh my gosh. B-O-L. That's all I know. I, my name Bull. I'm Bull. But his son is doing well. His son is doing well. Finally, good. I'm happy for him. Bull, Bull. His son's going really well. Yeah, Manu was always like, I killed the lion. And I was always like, yeah, you killed him when you shot a free throw and it came off the rim. <laughs> came off the rim and killed the lion. The lion was old as hell around the corner. The <laughs> <laughs> lion had no teeth. The lion had no teeth. He does briefly talk about the lion in that interview that you do, Jeff. So I'll put that on your YouTube channel. I'm calling bullshit on that. We'll never know. We'll never know. But rest in peace to the Sudanese shot blocker. Oh, I know. Trust me. I got it out of him one night after. 20 Heineken. <laughs> what a character and what a unique player in the NBA into sporting history. He had such a big heart. Oh, he had such a great sense of humor. I love that, too. Yeah. Every practice, before we go walk out, he'd go, you know, hit me today, right? I go, no, nah, don't fuck with me. Block my shot, I'm going to elbow you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing your memories there, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Adam. We'd love your interaction with the show. If you're watching on YouTube, please ask a question or add a comment below and Jeff and Rick will address it in future episodes. Podcast listeners can email the show if you prefer to do that. Just email me in all airness at gmail.com and I'll collate the submissions for the next episode. Now, thanks very much, guys, for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Listen, Adam, thank you for everything. See you, Adam. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Have a good night. Peace. Thanks, fans. Bye. Peace out.